Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our conversations with the Harvard Classics. We now turn to lecture number 15 where we will be talking about Paradise Lost Book number one. Um, first of all, I just want to make some general observations as we get ready for this conversation. First of all, let's just say that it would make sense that you've looked at already um, Harvard Classics lectures 11, 13, and 14 uh, before you turn to this lecture 15. In uh, lecture 11, I gave some introductory comments on Milton's prose, and there we looked at Areopagitica, and I also talked about the biography information of, of Milton. Uh, in lecture 13, um, we did some of uh, Milton's um, poetry uh, that kind of sets us up to the study of Paradise Lost. And then in lecture 14, I talked about introductions to this classic text, Paradise Lost. So if you haven't had the advantage of looking at that, you can go and watch that. Go to learnstrong.net, go down that left-hand side, and where it says Harvard Classics, you can find this stuff there for you. We now turn to lectures of each of the books of Paradise Lost, starting, of course, with book one. Now, let's remind we're working, as we work through this text, we're working with our reading levels. Go back and look at my very first lecture on the Harvard Classics where I outline again the reading levels as we will address them. At level one, what does the text say? Here we're looking to summarize, basically trying to paraphrase what we're reading. At level two, we divide into 2A and 2B. What does the text mean is the question, but here we're looking, for example, at issues like themes and messages and that kind of thing at level 2A and at level 2B rhetorically, not what the poet says, but how the poet says it. So we'll be looking at this poem as an epic poem and we'll be talking more at length about that, his use of blank verse and iambic pentameter, the epic, the epic similes and all that other stuff. Okay? And then finally at level 3, how do I relate to this text? That is to say, at level 3A, how does this text relate to other texts? We're going to see this a lot because, as we've already said, Milton is the king of allusions. Uh, um, you know, he's, a, he's able to do all kinds of doing that, uh, that connecting to, uh, new stuff to old stuff. Uh, uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. And then um, level 2, uh, 3B, how do I relate personally to this kind of thing? We're going to ask some, I hope, challenging questions. Guys, one of the things I'm trying to do is to prove to you with all of my lectures that I'm giving to you, but certainly with Paradise Lost, that while it is difficult in esoteric poetry, poetry and, and as we said, poetry, uh, calculus for poetry or whatever, there's got to be a way for you to connect it. Now let's remind ourselves that our learning definition is the ability, the desire and then the ability, to connect new information to old information in innovative and creative ways. In other words, to derive meaning, okay? So we're not just here to try and memorize what happens in book one of Republic, book two of Republic, uh, I'm sorry, book one of Paradise Lost, uh, book two of Paradise Lost, but our challenge here is to try to find ways to connect in meaningful ways. Of course, we'll point out that Milton is really the Tom Brady, for those of you that know, know your football and know about maybe the greatest of them all. It, it, really, Milton is that kind of guy, okay? In other words, he is really gifted at this, so we'll just kind of kick back and, and be in awe. Now, I, I want to share a, 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 a private moment here, a personal moment. My first introduction um, uh, uh, to formally my study of, of Paradise Lost came many, many years ago. With a, uh, with a college professor, uh, Dr. Robert Lawrence of York College. He was very influential in my life, and I just want to make a comment here of tribute to him. Um, you know, he, he, really, he really was uh, infinite in jest and, and really in sagacity as well. I mean, just an amazing guy. And I remember the first day he got ready to lecture on this poem. On the whiteboard, he just wrote a quote. I never will forget that this is how he introduced his study of uh, Paradise Lost. He put a quote from uh, Plato's Republic, Book 10, Section 617, the responsibility is with the chooser, God is justified. Now, there's obvious reasons why he would have put that there. We already saw in our last lecture this notion of theodicy, the justification of the ways of God to men. But I, 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 wanna, I wanna begin in the spirit of Dr. Lawrence and to say, I just want to share with you some amazing things about this poem, and we'll see how well it goes for all of us in our study. Obviously, as I've already said, I'm, build, I'm, I'm building off of all of the important people who I have studied, and many people have spent a lot of time with this poem. Now, I wish that I could just read every line 
of Paradise Lost with you and just work through every line. I don't have the time to do that. In the first book, however, I will be doing as much reading as possible for a number of reasons. One, I just want to get you involved in the actual language because it's so amazing. And so much is happening, obviously, in the first book of a, of a great poem like this, and I want to try and point that out as we go. Of course, primarily we'll be working at level one as I'm reading, but I'll be making observations that are level two and level three. So I hope you're taking notes. And I hope that as you're taking those notes, you could be able to differentiate my observations that are at level one summary versus level two, uh, of course, thematically uh, or rhetorical. And then, of course, at level three, how, you know, how do you relate this to other texts you're working with or, of course, to yourself personally, okay? We're going to start at level one. Um, we'll, we'll then move on to levels uh, two and three. We want to see again, just to remind from an earlier lecture, lecture, uh, lecture 14, we want to see again this text from multiple perspectives. We want to see it as a text that's, of course, literary. It's an epic poem. We want to see this text, of course, as a text of philosophy or theology. Theodicy is the question. Why, do, why, do, um, why is there evil in a world created by an all-loving, all-powerful deity? We mentioned that again in our previous lecture. And, of course, we want to see this as a political text that will touch on both psychology as well as sociology as we get into this thing. Now, this is huge because I want to make sure that we all understand this. Go back to an earlier lecture when I made the distinction between apologetic and non-apologetic studies of texts. An apologetic study of a text is to find out what's right or what's wrong with the text. A non-apologetic approach is to simply look at the text and try as best we can to understand it. I want to point this out right away. Because Paradise Lost is a text which is fundamentally a Christian text, although there are many readers of this text who have said, I'm not sure that's totally true all the time, I do want to point out that I have absolutely no interest in any way of being disrespectful to any number of traditions, whether they be religious or theological or, of course, philosophic as well. I'm just simply going to, I'm, I'm going to raise questions. I'm going to ask questions, as, as we always do in 303. But I want to understand right away that this is all done in the spirit of respect, and I don't want to in any way try to offend. But we are going to ask some challenging questions, because this poem demands it, and it does demand it. Okay. First of all, let's just give the large picture a schemata really quickly. There's basically three parts to this project, okay? Um, one, there's the invocation that we've already talked about in the, the beginning of the poem, in the middle, in medias race, in the middle of the action. Right away we're going to see, uh, we're going to pick up with Satan. Part two will involve Satan. It's an interesting decision on Milton's part. We'll talk more about it later. Why would it be the case that Milton would begin his greatest epic poem with Satan, not with God, not with Christ, not with Adam or Eve in the Garden of Eden, but rather with Satan. So we'll, we'll, we'll hear that one. And more particularly, in the first book, we're going to have five speeches by Satan that we're going to pay attention to. And that will be the heart of book one. And of course, immediately we're going to ask the same question we asked when we studied you know, Homer's Iliad, or we studied Virgil's Aeneid, or when we studied Beowulf together. What is up with these speeches? And at the end of our time together here in this lecture, we're going to ask that question. What's up with people giving speeches in our culture, and why is that so important or significant? So we'll obviously have to ask about that. Now, we've got to, we've got to ask this right away. Why begin with Satan, and what's up with Satan? I mean, I've often said that if, uh, if you pick up a Bible and read it, of course you're going to learn a lot of amazing things in it, but you're going to be even more fascinated by what's not in there. For example, if you get a yellow highlighter and start reading through any Bible in any translation, and every time you see some mention of Satan or Lucifer, you underscore with that yellow highlighter, you're going to have a lot of yellow highlighter left at the end of your reading. The reason is simple. There's not a lot of references to this personage in the Bible itself. Certainly not in the what we call in Christian theology, the Old Testament, um, what we often refer to as the Hebrew Scriptures. There's not a lot of mention of Satan. We need to understand that Satan is in large measure, then, a creation of Christian theology that's borrowed heavily from Greek understandings. And because that's the case, Milton is playing a powerful game right away with the beginning of, of Satan. We've already mentioned that in our Genesis 3 reading, there is no mention of Satan there. There is the mention of a serpent, but no mention of Satan. There are, of course, textual reasons, obviously, why there will be any number of church fathers and, of course, theologians who will make that connection in their study of biblical text, 
But explicitly, it's never made in the Genesis 3 passage. But this is where Milton decides to begin. Now, at the beginning of each of the different books, we will point out that in his second publishing of this poem, we said that he began with first 10 books and then went to 12 books, um, he published and wrote a, uh, what he called the argument, which is a summary. And I love, I love his prose so much that I think it makes sense to just start there. So let's go ahead and just look at the first book argument really quickly. The first book proposes, first in brief, the whole subject, man's disobedience, the loss thereupon of paradise. Notice he calls it paradise as opposed to Eden and therefore paradise lost, right? Wherein he was placed. Then touches the prime cause of his fall, the serpent, or rather Satan in the serpent. It's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, um, just a real brief phrase that we, not a throwaway phrase at all. Who, Satan, revolting from God and drawing to his side many legions of angels, was by the command of God driven out of heaven with all his crew into the great deep. Which action passed over the poem hastes into the midst of things and medias race, presenting Satan with his angels now fallen into hell, described here not in the center, for heaven and earth may be supposed as yet not made, certainly not yet accursed, but in a place of utter darkness, filthiest, uh, fitly is called chaos. Here, Satan with his angels lying on the burning lake, thunderstruck and astonished after a certain space recovers, as from confusion, calls up him, the elves above, who next in order and dignity lay by him, they confer of their miserable uh, manner, uh, their their miserable fall. We're going to have a lot of falls in this in this text. Satan awakens all his legions, who lay till then in the same manner confounded. They rise. This is going to be an interesting moment in book one. Their numbers, array of battle. This is what we'll call the cataloging of all the nasty uh, bad guys, the demons. Their chief leaders named according to the idols there uh, known afterwards in Canaan and the countries adjoining. To these, Satan directs his speech, confronts, uh, comforts them with hope yet of, rain, of regaining heaven, but tells them lastly of a new world and a new kind of creature to be created according to an ancient prophecy or report in heaven. For that, angels were long before this visible creation was the opinion of many ancient fathers. To find out the truth of this prophecy and what to determine thereon, he, Satan, refers to a full council. What his associates then attempt, pandemonium, this is going to be the creation of the palace. The palace of Satan rises suddenly, built out of the deep. The infernal peers there sit in council. And that's how the first book will end. So we're going to have, as I said, three movements in this one. One, we're going to have, of course, this invocation of the muse that we've already looked at. Two, we're going to meet Satan and his five classic speeches. And then finally, at the very end of book one, Satan and uh, the demons will construct this place in hell called pandemonium, uh, Milton made up the word, which basically pan, all demon, of course, di demons, uh, where they all live. And then at the very end of book one, we're going to have this decision that they're going to have to have this council uh, that will look, uh, many have argued, increasingly like what happens anytime you put a bunch of politicians together to have some kind of get together, parliament comes to mind immediately. Now, I've already worked with the opening lines of the invocation, so I'm going to go ahead and pass by those. But it's almost like there's a second invocation, and I'll begin there at line 27 with say first. Let's just read for a while now. I hope you have a copy of uh, Paradise Lost in front of you. Obviously, you can acquire one online. And let's take a look now at just some of the language of this poetry. Say first, no, we'll say, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep track of hell. Say first what cause moved our grandparents in that happy state in Eden, favored of heaven so highly to fall off from their creator and transgress his will for one restraint, lords of the world besides. In other words, he asks a simple question. Why would anybody living in Eden decide to jack it up? And, of course, here, we will begin by making the observation there are going to be a lot of falls in, of course, uh, book one. Who first seduced them, to continue now, who first seduced them to that foul revolt? Remember the opening lines of man's first disobedience. The infernal serpent is Milton's answer. 
He it was whose guile stirred up with envy and revenge deceived the mother of mankind what time his pride, we'll want to underline that word, won't we, had cast him out, of, out from heaven with all his hosts of rebel angels by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers. He trusted to have equaled the Most High if he opposed and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. So in other words, very simple, Satan decided he wanted no peers. He wanted to be reign in heaven, and for that he gets thrown out of heaven along with many of his angels. We'll meet them here in a bit. Him, the almighty power, hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamine chains and penal fire who dost defy the omnipotent to arms. In other words, he's spinning. And scholars have pointed out the amazing language here of how, I can't go into detail here, but it's quite remarkable how this language is constructed to give the sense of the falling, falling, falling for uh, uh, over nine days. Nine times, continuing. The space that measures day and night to mortal men, he, with his horrid crew, late vanquished, rowling in the fiery gulf, confounded, though immortal. But his doom reserved him to more wrath, for now he thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes. You can already see the way in which Milton is beginning to describe Satan as he looks around. Now he's been thrown out of heaven, right? Baleful eyes that witnessed huge affliction and dismay, mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate. At once, as far as angels can, he views the dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon, horrible on all sides round as one great furnace flame. Yet from those flames, no light, but rather darkness visible. It's an amazing word picture. Darkness visible. Wow. Served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades where peace and rest can never dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges and a fiery deluge fed with ever-burning sulfur, unconsumed. So let's just point out, and of course I already see a couple of you smiling, right? Dante, will you remember, has his sign, of course, there above the door. Of course, it's outside of 303 because some student years ago put a sign up there, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Here, of course, hope never comes. So let's go ahead and say it right away. Although Satan will spend much of his speeches saying, No, 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 We're, this is not all, it's not lost, this is not over. There is no hope, and we realize this right from the start, okay? Notice he continues, Such place... Eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious here, their prison ordained in utter darkness and their portion set as far removed from God in light of heaven as from the center thrice to the utmost pole. How unlike the place from whence they fell. There the companions of his fall, overwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire, he soon discerns and weltering by his side, one soon next in power and next in crime, long after known in Palestine and named Beel's above to whom the arch enemy and thence in heaven called Satan with bold words, breaking the horrid silence thus began. Now, we get our first speech by Satan. Let's just point out, Satan loves to talk about himself. The pronoun I and me are going to be constant through this. Satan is the great narcissist. And here he is, who is ready to talk. If thou beest he, but oh, how fallen, how changed, from him, who in the happy realms of life, clothed with transcendent brightness, did outshine myriads though bright. If he, whom mutual league, united thoughts and counsels, equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise, joined with me once, now misery hath joined in equal ruin. Into what pit thou seest, from what highest fallen. Notice again the repetition of the word fall, right? So much the stronger proved he with his thunder, and till then, who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet not for those, by the way, later in one of his speeches, Satan will point out, God was not completely honest with us because he didn't show us his true power, and for that reason, we actually decided that we would try to overthrow him. If we had known God is the deceiver, 
not me, in other words. It's a fascinating bit of rhetoric, right? Yet not for those, nor for the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change, though changed in outward luster that fixed mind. We're going to get back to this notion of his mind. But he says, I, I, I have not given up, and there is no way I'm repenting. And high disdain from sense of injured merit, that with the mightiest raised me to contend into the fiercest contention, brought along innumerable force of spirits armed, that durst dislike his reign, and me preferring his utmost power, with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven, and shook his throne. What? Listen to that these lines. This will sound for the first time, see here, talking to himself, and yet trying to reason through the fact that he was thrown out of heaven and down to hell he goes. What, he says, though the field be lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate and courage, never to submit or yield, and what is else not to be overcome. Now, in lectures on American thought, I've often pointed out <laughs> that one of the important ways to think about the American psyche is to say, of course, as we say it when we study the Declaration of Independence, don't tell me what to do. It's interesting, of course, that that document is written in 1776. Think about your date here of 1675, right? Fascinating bit of history, 1676, 1776. Here we go. Notice he says it. I'm not giving up. There is absolutely no way. Keep reading. That glory, never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with supplant knee and defy his power who from the terror of his arms so late doubted his empire that were low indeed. That were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall since by fate the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot wet fail since through experience of this great event in arms, not worse in foresight, much advanced, we may, with more successful hope, note the irony, resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs, and in the excess of joy, soul reigning holds the tyranny 